Well, good morning, and a very warm welcome to the Salvation Army this morning, whether you're here in person or whether you're watching on Catch Up later. Thank you to the band for that uh, introduction to our, our worship this morning. Um, I don't, don't normally single people out, but I want to single out to somebody a big welcome to, to Peter, Peter McCulloch, back in, back in the hall uh, for a long time. It's very nice to see you, Peter. Um, we thank uh, Paul and Nicola Baxter for the lovely flowers at the front of our hall. And we also think of Paul at the moment as he continues to recover from his recent knee surgery. Tomorrow there is no home league. Um, that resumes uh, a week tomorrow, the, uh, the 8th of November. Uh, but there is Ladies' Fellowship, and that is at 7.30. And I think you'll be talking a bit about poppies uh, and the history of poppies uh, tomorrow evening. Next Sunday at 10 a.m., we worship again here. We have a special meeting, special leaders, are the Chief Secretary and the Territorial Secretary for Leadership Development. Of course, those are Colonels Paul and Janine Main. We know the Colonel as well. Um, and we look forward to that, that Sunday morning. So, uh, dating your diary, certainly come along, please, and join with us on that Sunday morning, next Sunday. I want to bring to you again a message from Dorothy regarding the, uh, the Poppy Project. And I'll just read it again to you. She says, a big thank you for supporting the Poppy Project and contributing to our vision to create 1,000 poppies. We have created and collected nearly 3,000 poppies to date. Unfortunately, we have had to postpone the full events we have planned until November 2022 due to continued restrictions. There will be a small display of poppies present during the services on the 7th and 14th of November. A presentation of poppies will be in the foyer of the hall during Remembrance Week, along with a display in the charity shop representing the theme, Lest We Forget. Uh, a message from Turil to say, uh, those who wish to receive the core council minutes, uh, data protection regulations require her to update her records. So unless you've ne let her know very recently that you wish to have the core council meetings minutes, please let her know so she can just update her records for that. Uh, next Sunday also, we will have seen in the Let's Connect, there's going to be a hopes for the future rainbow display. Um, and everybody is invited to write a hope to be included on that rainbow. Please send them to Nicola Baxter, and her details are in the Let's Connect newsletter. In family news, core family news, we continue to think of those who are receiving treatment at the moment, um, and we pray for a speedy recovery uh, for those people involved. This morning, we, have, we, have, we still have special leaders this morning, in fact as well, a, a special returning leader. We're, we're, we're so grateful that they have come back to lead us again. And please give a warm welcome to Majors David and Michelle. Thank you. Well, it's good to be with you once again. So I, I apologize that I'm here again for you, but there we are. It's really nice for us to, to share with you. And we're going to share together in worship we're going to come in the right spirit. We're going to ask God indeed to reveal himself to us through his word. And that's the important reason why we gather. So I invite us to turn to Psalm 979, which is a, a song uh, that we find in the Salvation Army songbook. Soldiers of Christ, arise and put your armour on. And uh, strong in the strength which God supplies through his eternal son. We're going to sing the first two verses. Then we will read the third and fourth, and then we'll sing the fifth and the sixth. All right, thanks, Carl. Thank you.
So the songwriter uh, encourages us to make sure that we are right, that we are prepared, that we are guarded. So let's read verse 3 and 4. Leave no unguarded place, no weakness of soul. Take every virtue, every grace, and fortify the whole. To keep your armour bright, attend with constant care, still walking in your captain's sight, and watching unto prayer. The fifth and then the sixth verse. Thank you. song to start off our worship this morning where we're praising God where we're giving him our adoration and our worship where we are saying hallelujah hallelujah praise be the Lord well I was asked uh, if I would lead uh, this morning's uh, service morning's meeting uh, about a fortnight ago and I knew that this week was going to be a very busy week and so it was, as I say, a fortnight ago that I, uh, I sent through uh, the thoughts that I had then. I hadn't realised that today I could have talked about Halloween. I could have talked about the climate crisis. I could have talked about uh, the clocks going back. Did you all enjoy that this morning? <laughs> yes. I said to Michelle, coming, in the, coming to worship this morning in the car, I said, normally when we go to worship, everybody's really tired. I said, this today, everybody will be bright as a button, but they'll all be hungry halfway through because uh, they'll be waiting for their dinner. So I hope that uh, you're not that hungry anyway. But um, so this morning's um, meeting isn't based on any of those events, I'm afraid. Uh, if I had been a bit more thoughtful, I could have perhaps thought of that. I was thinking of what I was looking at myself. Uh, in the scriptures, uh, as I say, a fortnight ago. So that's what's transpired for this morning. But I want us, as it were, to, to just prepare ourselves and realise and recognise that we have come for a purpose this morning. Because if we do not feel as if we have that purpose, then how are we allowing God to actually communicate with us? We're going to share together in uh, Psalm 121. This is uh, the second psalm in the Songs of Ascent that we find in the Psalms. And uh, you'd be pleased to hear that my official Bible reader is with me this morning. She's not sitting up in the gallery. She is sitting here. So my official Bible reader is going to read to us Psalm 121. I 
lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. So Psalm 121 is a psalm that many of us have heard, many of us have read, many of us have used over the years. But it's a psalm of assurance that in all circumstances and situations of life, there is one constant, and that is the Lord himself. That he is present with us. He guides us, he directs us, he upholds us. He sometimes chastises us. He is ever present in our lives. And the reason we can have confidence in that is knowing that we, you and I as individuals, but also as a, a collective body, are precious to him. So precious to him. So valuable in his sight. There's an old Salvation Army um, song uh, which we're going to sing together 558 it's one of these again that perhaps we haven't sung for many years when he cometh when he cometh uh, to make up his jewels all his jewels precious jewels his loved and his own it gives us that image that real assurance that we are that ju those jewels we are those precious commodities that God has uh, for himself. So we're going to share together in uh, these three verses. Thank you. So we've got that concept, that image in our minds, that we are precious, that we are valuable, that God is constant in our lives. 
So what we're going to think about this morning, well I've been journeying for myself through some of the Old Testament uh, prophecies and I came across the book of Malachi and yes it's a book that I've referred to in previous days but I spent quite a bit of time just looking at this, this particular passage, uh, this particular book. It's, it's very short, it is literally just a matter of four chapters, uh, you can read it within ten minutes or so quite easily. So the prophet Malachi, which means messenger of the Lord, outlines God's opinion on the people of the day, of his day. And he says something quite distressing. He basically is saying that they, the people of the day, were disappointing God. And Malachi, through his, through his prophecy, rebukes the people and their sin now this was something that Nehemiah had already mentioned to them before, but obviously the people of the day had not taken any notice. There was bad leadership and a general attitude of neglecting and dishonouring God in people's lives. And all of this took place when the second temple had been completed, which indicates that people's focus on God was there. It had been completed, and yet the people's hearts were no longer focused on true worship. And Malachi attempts to reinforce the eternal truth that God loves his people. They were his precious jewels. Yet their attitude, their actions demonstrate how far away they were from God. They were accused of dishonouring God. They were going through the motions, but they clearly found the whole thing boring and wearisome. In fact, there is a passage in this text which says, it would be better that the temple was closed rather than continue in the way for God deserves nothing but the best, the sincere worship of a person's heart. The situation, you see, was so bad that the people had even said that serving God had no benefits whatsoever. It seems as if the evildoers to be better off than they were. Why bother to serve God? If it yields no tangible benefits, was their comments. And so when we look at the, this prophecy of Malachi, when we look at this text, which is littered with statements from God about the situation, the attitude that his people held him in, and the flippant replies of the people, we have to ask the question, to ourselves. I have to ask the question to myself. What's that telling me? What's that saying to me today? Do you remember this old chorus that uh, is in the, the Salvation Army Chorus book of 1945? It says, search me, O God, and know my heart today. Try me, Lord, and know my thoughts, I pray. See if there be some wicked way in me. And as I read this passage from Malachi, I could not help but think of this chorus and apply it to my own life and, and to, uh, to kind of share it with you this morning. So we're just going to sing this a couple of times uh, before we say our prayers together.
So let's then pray together. Father, we come into your house this morning. We come into this act of worship. And we just pause. And we ask those questions. What is our attitude to you today? How do we, as it were, want you to be involved in our lives? We've been reminded that we are precious in your sight. We have been reminded that we are so important to you. And yet we've also read how sometimes we fail you. We are people who do not hold you in the right way. Father, this morning as we come into worship, we want to say, Lord, search us. Enable us to examine ourselves in, in, in your eyes. And Lord, if there are things that we need to put right, give us the courage. Give us the opportunity. Give us the, the, uh, the will to make sure that we are as we should be in your sight. Lord, this is a special day on so many, many areas. We think particularly of the climate situation and, and the world leaders who will be discussing that. Big, big issues, Lord, and sometimes perhaps we don't even know what the best thing is to pray for. But we just ask indeed that your hand will be over that situation. We think of those who will be misguided today because of the uh, paraphernalia with Halloween and things like that. Lord, let people realise that it's love and it's joy and peace that makes the world go round rather than the evil one. And also, Lord, we just ask indeed that you will be with those who we know and have promised to pray for. We think of those who are suffering uh, due to illness, suffering due to loneliness, suffering due to uh, misunderstandings, whatever. And we ask, Lord, in your mercy, just be with them today. And so we come back to this moment, these precious moments that we have. We have come into your temple, we have come into your house, we have come to engage with you. And as we do, help us not to be like the people of Malachi's day. Help us to be people who will search after you. And we pray this so that your will is done in our lives. So hear our prayer both those that we have said as well as those that we feel in our hearts as we join together in the prayer that you taught your family to say our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And amen. Thank you. So we have the concept. We have the construct, we have the context of what we've been thinking of this morning. And as we do, we have to kind of place ourselves in the, in the kind of position that the people of Malachi's day were hearing the word of God and responding to those, those comments. And as we hear those words spoken, let us, as it were, Allow the Spirit to make sure that we, as individuals, are answering the questions, considering the response that we make to Almighty God. But before we do that, we're going to look at uh, Song 716, and uh, we're going to uh, sing these three verses. Let me love thee, thou art claiming every feeling of my soul. Let that love in power prevail in. Render thee my life, my all. We have the three verses, words written by Herbert Booth. And uh, if you are able and wanting to, we'll stand and we'll sing it through. Thanks. <laughs>
be seated. Wow, what words, what words they've sung. Tremendous words there. Love will soften every sorrow. Love will lighten every care. Love and questioning will follow. Love will triumph. Love will dare. And then we come to the word of God. So if you wish to look at the book of Malachi, we are just going to look at some selected verses that we find there. I'm not going to read the whole four chapters, but I just want to give you an idea of what was going on between God and the people. There was this, uh, this kind of comment that God is saying, and the people were responding in a, in a justifying themselves type of way. We look at verse 2 of Malachi 1. And God says this, I have loved you, says the Lord, but you ask, how have you loved us? And then in verse 6, it says, I am your father, I am your master. Where is the respect that's due to me? But you people say, how have we shown contempt? For you a name. How have we defiled you? And then we go to verse 17 of chapter 2, and it says, You have wearied the Lord with your words, and you say, How have we wearied him? We continue in chapter 3 and verse 7, where it says, Return to me. And I will return to you, says the Lord. But you people say, how are we to return? How are we robbing you, O God? You have spoken arrogantly against me, says the Lord in verse 13 of chapter 3. Yet you ask, what have we said against you? And you see that in that passage, we have this kind of tit-for-tat thing. God is saying something, and the people are responding, saying, well, justify that then. Come on then. When did you say that? And that's what we'll be looking at today. That's what we're going to see. How sometimes we hear the word of God, and we respond in this kind of negative in this justifying type of attitude, just like the people of Malachi's day. But before we concentrate on the word, we are just going to ask that the Spirit will come and fall on us and allow us to be free of any of those constraints so we hear what God is saying to us. The band are going to bring to us their message fall afresh on me.
what a fitting piece to play before we open the word of God. And we just ask indeed that the spirit will fall on each of us just now. You see, when we look at this prophecy, we look at this, this text that we find from Malachi, we see that there is these questions that God is asking his people. And then there are these responses that the people are making. And the first one that we see really challenges God's defining characteristic. And that's what kind of starts off the debate. Because God is saying, I love you. And the people's response is, how have you loved us? What's the proof that you have loved us? And that's an attitude as age old as humankind is and has had with God. Do you remember God rescuing the children of Israel and they were coming out of, of Egypt after slavery, after all the oppression and the children of Israel were, were finding themselves in the wilderness and saying, well, wasn't it better to be a slave than wander around in the wilderness? They had forgotten the love and the care that God had given. They were kind of were looking at their surroundings rather than at the person God. They wouldn't have they, 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 in a sense, wouldn't believe unless God acted and demonstrated his love to them. We see that in the New Testament. The scribes and the Pharisees of Jesus' day wouldn't accept his teaching unless he performed a miracle at their whim. And it seems as if we can't accept the truth that God loves us without a demonstration of it. How many times have I heard people say, Lord, I pray if you get me out of this situation, I know that you'll care for me and that you love me. It's a bit like you've got to prove yourself. And yet we as salvationists, we as New Testament people, surely don't need such demands. Because the Easter story and how it has has it become or can become a reality in our lives? Surely that is enough. And yet, if we are honest before God, if our experience is examined before Him, if we search our lives before Him, our worship to Him at times is often stale and is in effect asking the same question as the people of Malachi's day asked, how have you shown us your love? There's another old chorus that we used to sing, lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thy love to me, lest I forget thine agony, lead me to Calvary, and perhaps sometimes we, even though we are attempting to love and to serve and to follow God, we need to be reminded, we need to be refreshed, we need to be led back to Calvary to recognize the sacrifice, the salvation, the overwhelming expression of God's love to us each. The people of Malachi's day said, how? Have you shown your love to us? The salvationists, the Christians, the New Testament people of today can say, proof is in Calvary. We know this chorus? Let's sing.
for the people of Malachi's day. They were, it wasn't proof enough that God loved them. And then God says, where is your respect for me? In chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. And the people of the day says, how, how have we shown contempt for you? One other version of this particular verse says, how have we despised you? Strong language, isn't it? To despise somebody. And yet we recall Isaiah 53, he was despised and rejected. A man of sorrows acquainted with grief. We hid our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. You know, to despise somebody is to look down on them with contempt. To consider them worthless. To willfully disregard their authority. This morning you have made the effort. We have made the effort to come into his presence, to worship him. And Jesus is the focus of our worship. And we therefore need to give him his place. We need to give him his authority in our lives. And everything that we engage in, in worship, has worth. There is a point of meeting together. There is a point of doing what we do within worship. It is a point that participation together in worship is necessary. It is a point that the result of worship can change things in each of our lives. And we need to remind ourselves that we come and we need to worship in spirit and in truth. That we have the right spirit that we have the right truthful frame of mind as we come into his presence. Otherwise, we are despising. We are not showing the respect that God has, is worthy of. I don't know what you did yesterday. I had two hours to kill yesterday. Let me tell you the story. My second son treated me to go and watch the All Blacks at the stadium. He bought the tickets, I'm glad he bought them, I didn't. And uh, we went to watch the All Blacks, it was a disaster, but never mind. We, we went and watched the All Blacks, it was the experience, wasn't it? And, and I was thrilled, but when I, I, I got the information about it, I had to do a COVID test, I had to download an app to get the tickets. I had to uh, be in the stadium two hours before kickoff. I had to uh, secure transport there and back. I had to make sure that I had some Snickers bars in my little pockets so to keep me going through the time. And that was before kickoff even started. And I just thought to myself yesterday as I sat there, Whiling away those two hours, just looking around at all the people who had gathered to worship in the Principality Stadium. And I just thought to myself, they were really prepared. They really made the effort to get there. They really, as it were, engaging in the whole point of it. You know, sometimes many people, myself included at times, the only preparation I do about Sunday morning is I in my shirt. Do you get the point I'm making? Emlyn Davis is a Baptist minister and he wrote in his book, Man of God, he said this, which has challenged me. The tragic truth is that we bring nothing to our public worship. How many of us pray for the service before we leave home? How many of us ever read scripture or any other literature that would enrich our mind and uplift our spirit for the service? If public worship is a corporate act, how and why do you leave it to one person? We need a deeper awareness of our hunger for God and a sure conviction that God can satisfy it. Do we respect God? 
Are we guilty of contempt in our worship simply by not offering him our very best as we prepare and we engage in worship? Or, as it says in verse 13, is it a boring and wearisome ritual that you are engaging in? God says, where is your respect for me? How have we not respected you, God? I'll leave that thought with you. But when we go into chapter 2 and verse 17, we see another question from God. God is saying here, you have wearied the Lord with your words. Now, I think that this is a very disturbing and controversial theological arena. To say or to even suggest that God gets fed up with us takes away that very precious thought and truth that we can come to him at any time, regardless of how often we've been in his presence previously. Again, we, 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 we emphasize this in our, in, our, in our choruses, whisper a prayer in the morning, whisper a prayer at noon, whisper a prayer at evening, to keep your heart in tune. So what is Malachi saying here? He is not indicating that God is weary of us coming to him in our prayers. He is indicating that God is weary of the false beliefs of his people, that they continue to hold on to wrong aspects of what a true relationship is with God. And the sentiment encapsulated in the statement as outlined in verse 17 tells us that God is weary of this. And that isn't just my interpretation. It's not something I've got from a book. It's not an edict from any headquarters. It's found in Scripture. And God's own direction is to be right with God. One needs to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. That you are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And that you love one another as I loved you. And in a sense, Malachi is saying to me, I hope he's saying it to each of us, look, this is what it's about. Don't weary me with false and misunderstood things. He doesn't want to be misrepresented. So it seemed to me that Malachi was in this state that whatever he said, then the people had an answer. You know, my three-year-old is like that. Everything you say to them, they've got an answer, you know? And, and we, we need to recognize this is the situation with Malachi. But wait, there is hope. And the questions and the responses of Malachi do change. And if we turn to uh, chapter 3, verse 7, we, we find that God is saying about you returning to me. Come on, return to me. And then the people are saying, how can we return? So in fact, the people are asking, how can we be restored? How can we get back into the right relationship with you? Those, as they were tit-for-tat conversations, have been, re have been replaced. And the complaints seem to be easing off. And here we have a change. The ones who have been accused are seeking to put things right and boldly asking God, what must we do to return? How can we sort this out? And it's a bit like a preamble of the prodigal son, isn't it? In Luke 15. In that, in that story, the son, when isolated, has asked a similar question. And the outcome was, he arose, came to his father, and he confessed his sin. He knew where to go. And he knew what attitude he had to have when he got there. Is seeking forgiveness, in forgetting God's love, in thinking that service, that worship is worthless, in using 
God selfishly, not investing in him and others, and misrepresenting God's word. And so there is a way out, there is a, a, a relief, there is an opportunity for us to be restored, as we read in Malachi. So everything's okay now, or is it? Because Malachi says something else. Just immediately after this. And sometimes it's, it's a trap we all fall into. It's a trap that God is saying, watch out. Because this could be you a downfall. And in chapter 3 and verse 8, we see God saying, yes, you say all these things. But you rob me. You cheat me. And the people say, how? How are we cheating you? The previous discourse outlines our misgivings in following God. We can be restored in fellowship with him by returning to the Father and, and confessing our sins. But then it's wham! God says, you've done all this in repentance and restoration, and yet you still cheat me. You still rob me. You still not putting me in my rightful place. But if you do, if you do, he says, then heaven's window will open and numerous blessings will descend upon you. And as we look at this passage of scripture, we prove God's word by responding to his wishes, not holding back, supporting his church, supporting his people appropriately, being responsible disciples, testing God, proving his word. And in verse 10 of chapter 3, it says, test me in this and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will be not enough room to store it. Oh, wow, what a promise, what a promise. And yet his people are sitting there in Malachi's day thinking to themselves, but this affects me. And they need to respond. You see, Malachi is the, the last book in the Old Testament. And he describes the opinion of God upon his people. I wonder what God would be saying to his people of today. And what their excuses or responses to him would be like. God is still saying, I loved you. I love you. And he is saying, I've proved that through Jesus. He still say, please respect me. Honour me in your living and your worship. He is also saying, don't misrepresent me in the ways of the world. He's even saying, come home. Come back to me. Come back with an attitude of repentance. Honour me in your giving, both to my church and also to my people. And he's also saying, oh, please prove me. Prove my promise and I'll be prepared to open heaven's windows for the blessings of God himself to be showered upon us. That's what the word of God says. But we have to respond. Some words that I've never ever sung before in my recollection are in that chorus book of 1945 to the same tune that we sang, Search Me, O God. Words that Colonel Stobart wrote and it says the Saviour divine, come cleanse my heart from sin, burn out the dross and make me pure within. All that I have to be, I freely give. And for thy glory, I will ever live. We've asked that the Spirit of God will fall afresh on us. The Word of God says, test me.
prove me and you will be surprised at what will happen. Let's sing these words together in an attitude of prayer. Father, this morning we have heard your word. We have felt your spirit touch upon our lives. Lord, we just want to say, yes, we recognise your love to us. And we give you thanks for it. Lord, forgive us for the time when we have not respected you. When perhaps we have shown contempt for you. When we have defiled you by our attitude, by our experience, by our... Yeah, just how very living. Lord, forgive us for the time when we think it's better. What's the point? When we think that we are weary and bored of worship. You are the object of our worship. Lord, we also recognise that we have wearied you by our misrepresentation. We have given opinions that are not based on your word. We are people who perhaps follow the culture of our day. Lord, guide us and direct us, we pray. But we thank you, Father, that you are a God who says you can return. You can come back into the fold. You can be restored. You can be forgiven. And we give you thanks for that. And Lord, this morning, each of us just bows before you and say, Lord, forgive us for those times when we have not obeyed you correctly and then you also say to us that we need to be careful in our service in our very living that we do not cheat you we do not rob you that we give you your worth in our lives and so Lord today at this time at this moment we just ask indeed that you will burn out the dross, make us pure within, and that we will respond to see your glory and the heaven's windows open and the blessings descend upon us. You said, test us, test me. And so we say to you today, Lord, we claim your promise. And we ask indeed that you will bless us abundantly. Make that our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And amen. Well, thank you very much um, for your attention and your courtesy and, in, and your invite. I will tell you that the Sergeant Major did promise me a parking space. Never got it, but never mind. But well, we're going to conclude our...
our worship this morning. 686. And to thee, O Saviour King, our allegiance now we bring. We're going to sing the three, three verses of, the, of this. We're going to sing, I don't know what I've said, what we're going to sing. We're uh, going to leave one of them up. We can't. Yeah. We'll sing the first, the second, and the last, please, of, uh, of this song. Thank you. Now we pray indeed the love of God that the peace, inspiration and example of the Lord Jesus and that the power of God the Holy Spirit will be with each of us now and forevermore. And together we say, Amen. Amen. Good morning and God bless you.